Hello friends, I'm Heath Carter. I've met some of you and look forward to meeting many more of you in the weeks and months to come. My family and I moved to Princeton this past summer and we joined Nassau this past spring. So since I'm new to many of you, I thought I'd just start by telling you a little bit about myself. I'm a Midwesterner originally. I grew up in Kansas and then moved to Southern California when I was 10 years old. By the time I was finishing high school, I had really become deeply interested in politics, so I was excited. I got into Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Couldn't wait to be uh, just down the street from the White House and the nation's capital. Um, never anticipated that I would end up majoring in theology, but that's exactly what happened. Along the way, I also fell deeper in love with history and specifically the history of American Christianity. I went on to do graduate work in that field, both at uh, the University of Chicago Divinity School and then my PhD at the University of Notre Dame before accepting a position on the history faculty at Valparaiso University. It's a Lutheran university right outside downtown Chicago, about 50 miles in Northwest Indiana. And I worked there for seven years until this past summer when I accepted a new position as Associate Professor of American Christianity at Princeton Seminary, just down the street from the church. So I'm really excited to have the chance to spend some time with you all, at least digitally, this month, and in no small part because I believe that history really matters for the church. It doesn't offer easy answers, it doesn't tell us exactly what we should do today, but history helps us to understand how we got here. And it's therefore, in my view, a great help, really essential to anyone and everyone seeking to discern about how we might most faithfully move forward today calling this series The Church in Times of Crisis, Snapshots from American History. When I first chose this theme, the pandemic was really top of mind, but in the last two weeks, the sense of our contemporary crisis has deepened further still. As the heinous murders of black citizens from Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor to Tony McDade and George Floyd catalyzed an intense new wave of protests across the land. As we journey together into the past, you'll see that the great cloud of witnesses that has gone before us face seemingly insurmountable challenges in their day, too. There's some comfort in that realization, but many a cautionary tale to be found as well. The hard truth is that American Christians have often faltered and failed in their efforts to live out the prophet Micah's call to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. The triumphalism of so many American believers past, their sense of themselves as the new Israel, might well strike us today as so much sinking sand. But along the way, we will also find what Mark Knoll in his classic history of Christianity in the United States and Canada calls, quote, signs of contradiction. These are moments often unfolding in the shadows of the big headlines of any given day, when the truth and power of the gospel break into the brokenness of this world. We'll find both hard truths and signs of contradiction in our first snapshot. So come with me to Philadelphia. It's late in the summer of 1793 in the city of brotherly love, also serving for the time being as the nation's capital, with Washington, D.C. still under construction, was racked by a terrible epidemic. It was one of the worst outbreaks of yellow fever that anyone had ever seen. No one knew where it came from. The disease is actually spread by mosquitoes and likely arrived in Philadelphia, which was a bustling center of trade at the time, from the Caribbean. But at the time, Benjamin Rush, the city's leading doctor, believed that yellow fever was caused by miasmas, as he called them, basically polluted fog. So he thought that the best means of prevention was simply to clear the air. The treatments he prescribed reflected his fundamental misunderstanding of the disease as well. Its earliest symptoms were headaches and chills, but soon came sharp pains in the chest and often an upset stomach. Next were raging fevers and the yellowing of the skin as the disease attacked the person's liver. In all too many cases, the sick lost their minds before they lost their lives. And Rush championed a twofold response that involved both a bleeding technique as well as the ingestion of mercury in order to purge the bowels. As devoted as he was to his patients, I don't think you'll be all that surprised that they may well have died at an even more harrowing clip than the general population of Philadelphia did during this terrible epidemic. 
didn't take long before the city started to feel downright post-apocalyptic. Prior to epidemic, it had been the nation's largest and wealthiest city, not to mention one of the most vibrant. It was the kind of place where you could not only see George Washington's carriage rumbling down the street, but also rub elbows with people from all over the world. But within weeks of the fever, Philadelphia felt like a ghost town. Many of those with the resources to flee did, including Thomas Jefferson, who hurried back to Monticello. Those who waited sometimes ran into roadblocks along their journey. In short order, Baltimore banned Philadelphians who couldn't prove that they'd been away from the diseased hotspot for at least seven days, while Virginia put ships from Philly in quarantine. Meanwhile, back in the city of brotherly love, hospitals were overwhelmed, infected homes were barricaded, and in some, dead bodies were left in decay. By mid-September, one Philadelphian exclaimed, quote, terror now became universal, unquote. It would be really hard to overstate the stakes of this moment. The United States was in its infancy, and now the social order in its capital city was teetering on the brink. Could Americans pull together and overcome, or was their new nation to be a short-lived experiment indeed? In this most difficult of moments, Benjamin Rush reached out to one of Philadelphia's leading black citizens, the preacher, Richard Allen. Another of Rush's misguided presumptions was that African Americans were immune to the fever. He thought this because um, infection in black communities took longer to detect. And believing this, Rush hoped that black Philadelphians would lead in caring for the sick. He assured Allen that it would endear them to their white neighbors. Sure enough. Allen and many of his fellow black believers answered the call, jumping into the middle of the epidemic's fray. They wanted to love their neighbors. But in the process, they also hoped that Russia's assurances would prove true, that their service would endear them to white people and in that way advance the cause of abolition, which they and their ancestors had been fighting for for generations. Sustained by prayer, Allen and other black Philadelphians ventured into the homes of critically ill and dying white people. They visited at least 20 families per day, nursing the sick who many times had to be restrained in order to be treated. They bled them as Rush recommended and they fed them. They carried out the dead. They dug graves and placed not only persons but also infected beds, linens, clothes, and more in them, putting themselves in harm's way all the while. Meanwhile, they kept in regular touch with city officials reporting on the status of the epidemic. They hoped to be, quote, useful as possible, unquote not as servants or as slaves, but as fellow citizens. The truth was that throughout the yellow fever outbreak of 1793, black Philadelphians were nothing short of heroes. But as the epidemic worsened, many white people turned a suspicious eye on black emergency healthcare workers. When things were stolen, black people got blamed. Many white Philadelphians harbored fears that black people were starting to overrun the city. With the city's population reduced by more than half as some fled and others died, African Americans, once a small minority, seemed suddenly a much larger presence. And amid these rapidly changing conditions, white people were hostile and even violent to black nurses and black pallbearers. The city's mayor spoke up in defense of them, but was careful to distinguish between what white citizens owed black persons. He wouldn't use that word citizen when it came to black people. And it got worse. By the time the epidemic was under control, some four to 5,000 persons had died, fully 10% of whom were African-American. Allen himself had been infected and spent two months in the hospital, and yet even still, adding insult to injury, Matthew Carey, a well-known printer in Philadelphia, published a pamphlet that became an immediate sensation. It went through four editions. It sold more than 10,000 copies in its first two months. And in that pamphlet, Carey condemned, quote, the vilest blacks, unquote, for purportedly plundering Philadelphia during the epidemic. He named no one in particular. He offered no specifics or evidence, but his accusations played on widespread prejudice. Richard Allen and his friend Absalom Jones were indignant, and they responded in a pamphlet of their own, in the process becoming the authors of the new nation's first black-authored, black-signed political pamphlet. But as they themselves noted, the damage had been done. In responding heroically to one crisis, black Philadelphians had run smack into another, the white denigration of black lives. 
This dehumanization was no less a crisis just because by that point it could rightly be considered chronic. To be clear, anti-black racism was not primordial, let alone natural. In fact, in the early colonial period, cultural and religious differences loom much larger than skin color, and the boundaries between peoples were somewhat porous. As a pattern of intermarriage between European, indigenous, and enslaved persons attests. This practice became common enough that colonial authorities in Virginia and elsewhere felt the need to legislate against it. And notably, when they did, they didn't use racial categories, distinguishing instead between Christians, quote unquote, people whom we would now call white, and everyone else. Now, on the ground, far from the legislature, people didn't always pay attention to these distinctions. In fact, in 1676, one Virginia planter fomented a revolt that united many poor white indentured servants and enslaved West Africans against the rest of the planter class. Bacon's rebellion proved a turning point. Intent on holding on to power and aware of how this interracial coalition threatened it, the planter class sought to regain the loyalty of poor white people. The Virginia elite pivoted decisively from indentured to enslaved labor and meanwhile passed a new series of laws distinguishing between white and black persons. The elite's deliberate bid to cultivate racism yielded a harvest of poisonous fruit. Sure enough, by the turn of the 18th century, race was becoming a structuring reality in American life. The expansion of slavery posed a major dilemma for Christian churches, which were still trying to find their way on this continent. Centuries-old associations of Christianity and freedom were now put to the test, and for the most part, it turned out disastrously. By the late 17th century, new missionaries arriving from Europe were shocked to discover that many white American colonists had begun to mount an argument that the enslaved were not capable of becoming Christians in the first place. Missionaries were among the most likely to argue for the universality of the Christian message, but they often made devastating moral compromises of their own, requiring enslaved converts to take oaths like this one before they were baptized. Quote, that you do not ask for the holy baptism out of any design to free yourself from the duty and obedience you owe to your master while you live. Unquote. In this way, white Christians forged a faith that sanctified a slave society. Hard truths but also signs of contradiction. As enslaved Africans began to convert to Christianity, they discovered in the gospel a truth that surpassed anything that the white master class had ever intended them to find. God longed for the enslaved to be set free. As Manisha Sinha shows in her magnificent history of abolitionism, movements for black liberation started first among black people. And as she puts it, quote, the ideological underpinnings of black anti-slavery lay in an anti-racist construction of Christianity, unquote. From the poet Phyllis Wheatley to the black Congregationalist minister Lemuel Haynes, the first generations of black Christians on this continent insisted on their equal dignity and on the blatant immorality of slavery. And Richard Allen stood in this proud tradition. As much as he was dismayed, nothing about Matthew Creed's screed against Afro-Philadelphians' conduct during the epidemic surprised him in the least. He had heard it all before. In the months before the epidemic, in fact, Allen and his friend Absalom Jones had courageously confronted the deep racism of the city's white Christians. In the early 1790s, the leadership at St. George's Methodist Episcopal Church, where Allen sometimes preached, had informed uh, the black members of the church that they could no longer sit in their usual pews. The sanctuary was now to be segregated. Initially, African Americans were relegated to the back of the church, but before long, it was the balcony. When Allen and Jones refused to go along with this latest indignation, the church's trustees accosted Jones during prayer, no less, pulling him up off his knees and saying, you must get up, you must not kneel here. Jones pleaded them to at least wait until the prayer was over, but the elders refused, and as they pressed the issue, something remarkable happened. Every black person in that sanctuary walked out. Allen and many of those who walked out of St. George's that day went on in the months after the epidemic to found Mother Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church, 
the first congregation in what would go on to become the nation's first independent black-led denomination. By the end of Allen's life, Mother Bethel's congregation numbered in the thousands, and it had become an important stop along the Underground Railroad to Freedom, living out in tangible and risky ways its founder's conviction that, quote, God himself hath pleaded slaves' cause, unquote. Meanwhile, for more than two centuries now, the AME has been one of the most important African-American institutions in the country. And this enduring vessel of liberating Christian faith emerged by way of response to a crisis embedded within yet another crisis. Signs of contradiction indeed. At some point when the pandemic allows, I would really encourage you to visit Mother Bethel. It's a still active congregation in Philadelphia's historic Society Hill neighborhood, just down the street from the Liberty Bell. And if you want to learn more about Richard Allen's remarkable life and witness, you might pick up a copy of Richard Newman's excellent biography of him. It's called Freedom's Prophet. One thing that I take away from this particular snapshot, and really from the whole history of American Christianity, is the urgent need for white Christians to listen and learn from black believers. That's true always, and all the more so in a moment like the one we're in right now. So a question I'll leave with you with is, what voices are you listening to right now as you make sense of the recent murders of African Americans and the protests that have followed so closely on their heels? Blessings on the week ahead. I look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Take care, everyone.